Thank you for asking me to join you at the MIBO meeting. My name is Elizabeth Shepherd, and I'm speaking to you from London. My presentation, which is entitled FMO3, a protein that can multitask, will, I hope, give you an introduction to some of the key roles that FMO3 plays in our daily lives. Now the full name of the protein FMO3 is flavin containing monooxygenase 3. And mutations are changes in the base sequence of DNA and sometimes these changes can have unfortunate consequences. For the FMO3 gene, some changes can lower or eliminate the activity of the FMO3 protein. And it's the activity is too low of the protein, then this causes the disorder known as trimethylaminuria or TMAU. Now I'll first talk a little bit about TMAU and then introduce you to the role that FMO3 plays in drug metabolism. And in some ways these two are interrelated. And I'll discuss some of the consequences that genetic variation in the FMO3 gene might have uh, for drug response of an individual. So FMO3 is also known as a drug metabolizing enzyme. But first let me just remind you about uh, trimethylaminuria. So what does FMO3 do and why is it problematic if you have an FMO3 protein that does not function well. Now our gut is populated by many different bacteria and there is a group of bacteria that benefit when we eat food rich in a chemical called choline. The arrow shows what the gut bacteria do to choline which is found in many foods including eggs, soya and red meat. So the bacteria will attack choline and produce the chemical called trimethylamine. So why do the bugs do this? Well, it is advantageous for them to have trimethylamine around as they use this as their nutritional source. They basically like trimethylamine. But the bugs produce too much trimethylamine to use and the excess chemical is then rapidly absorbed by the body and enters the liver. Now in the liver, the enzyme FMO3 will add one atom of oxygen. You can see in this slide um, an O that stands for oxygen and is being attached to the N, the nitrogen, of trimethylamine. The trimethyl or trimethylamine name is because you can see three little groups, CH3, which occurs three times. So that's the trimethyl and then we have the nitrogen and the nitrogen is attacked by the oxygen. And this creates a chemical called trimethylamine N-oxide. Now if this reaction happens, then the odor producing trimethylamine is converted to trimethylamine N-oxide. And this is a non-odorous chemical. But if the FMO3 activity is compromised, that is it is lowered because of some change in DNA which then changes the protein, then this conversion to the N-oxide will not be effective. And therefore the trimethylamine leaves the body unchanged and this is what contributes to the body and breath odor. Now in this slide, I show along the white and the blue bar many of the changes that have been found to cause trimethylaminuria. This is a complex kind of a diagram, but the take home message here is that in different families, different changes can give rise to trimethylaminuria. And what links all these differences is that they are all, the res all result in a protein that cannot do its job properly. 
So FMO3 is a protein made up of 532 amino acids. And the numbers on this bar refer to the amino acid that is changed as a result of a particular mutation. So if you focus on P153L, this means that the amino acid at position 153 is changed from a P, P stands for proline, to an L, where L stands for leucine. And in 1997, we published the first report that showed that trimethylaminuria is an inherited disorder caused by changes in FMO3. And the graph demonstrates what happens when the P at 153 becomes an L. So you can see from the orange line, whose slope increases over time, that the enzyme in this case, when the, there is a proline at position 153, can convert trimethylamine to trimethylamine N oxide. However, the mutation, leucine at 153, you can see the purple line is just simply flat, and this enzyme has no or very little activity towards trimethylamine. Now, I just wanted to digress a little and just to explain to you about some of the nomenclature we use, which might be perplexing you a little. So, amino acids and the different ways we name them. As technology has progressed, we've learned more and more about the order of amino acids uh, in our proteins, and we now have the sequence of the human genome and of many different genomes and to kind of cope with this information we have to use a shorthand notation to be able to record the information in a protein. So if we just look at this table, on there are actually 20 amino acids found in our proteins or mainly 20 and I've just given an example of six of them here, so you can get the idea of, of how we use this terminology. So the full name of an amino acid, alanine, we had a three-letter code, which we thought was fine until we sequenced the human genome, and then had to come up with something better, which we call the one-letter code. So for the three-letter code, it would be ala, that takes up too much space on the page or on the computer screen, so we use an A. Glycine was, is gly in the three-letter code, or G in the one-letter code. Glutamic acid, glue, or E. Leucine, lu, or L. Lysine, lyse, or K. Proline, pro, or P. And if you see an X, this means stop. This means that the protein sequence is shorter than it should be, because there is a mutation that prevents any more amino acids being added to the protein chain. Now, FMO3 is also what we call a drug metabolizing enzyme. And you've seen with choline, choline is a foodstuff. It's actually foreign you know, food is foreign to us. Many dietary components are foreign. We don't think of them as foreign because we just eat them without thinking, but they are foreign. And drugs are foreign too. So drugs and other chemicals foreign to the body have to be removed. The body has to be able to cope with getting rid of these excess of chemicals. And so very fortunately, um, we have evolved a defense mechanism to clear foreign chemicals from the body, and this is called detoxification. Now, detoxification can occur in many organs in the body, and these will include the gut, lungs, skin, and kidney, for example. But the real powerhouse for detoxification is the liver. And here, as you saw with trimethylamine, many chemicals can undergo changes that allow them to be removed from the body. And chemicals get removed from the body in our urine, our bile, and feces. 
Now, therapeutic drugs are foreign chemicals, but they've only been around for a very short time. So we didn't suddenly evolve this detoxification system to deal with, for, with uh, therapeutic drugs. We've evolved it over time to help us cope with our natural environment. So it's a pretty amazing um, evolutionary system that basically allows us uh, to survive on a day-to-day on -day basis. So, as, so let me explain how FMO3 can detoxify a drug. So this little pink triangle here represents a drug. And many drugs are, have a chemical property which makes them hydrophobic. This means that they can pass through the oily membranes that surround a cell. So this is very advantageous to us to have drugs that have this property because they can get into our cells very effectively. Now the problem is once they've got into the cell we have to get them out again so that they can be cleared from the body. And this is one of the roles that FMO3 can play. So FMO3 will add an oxygen onto the drug. This then changes the drug into a chemical that now prefers to be in a water environment and it will leave the cell by various mechanisms and then be able to be excreted through uh, usually the urine um, in the case of FMO3 but sometimes in the bile and the feces. Now by adding that oxygen onto the drug, FMO3 creates a chemical which can be an N oxide if the drug has a nitrogen and the oxygen goes on to the nitrogen. And actually many drugs have a sulfur and FMO3 can add an oxygen onto the sulfur as well and that produces a chemical called the S oxide. So why does drug clearance matter? Well, it matters a great deal because as you will know, if you're on medication, your clinician or medical practitioner might have uh, prescribed you a drug and said take one twice a day or three times a day. And the reason for this is because of drug metabolism. So if we look at a normal situation where a person is able to carry out a detoxification process, when you're given a drug, you take the drug and as it's absorbed, the plasma concentration of that drug will increase. As you can see here, the pink arrow indicates the dose and the blue arrow that a uh, blue sorry line that's increasing in indicates plasma increase. And then as the body detoxifies this drug and removes it from uh, the body, then the concentration decreases. And you take your next dose, the plasma concentration increases and over time the chemical will be removed and so on. So we have metabolism and we have the drug concentration dropping before the next dose. However, if you happen to have a mutation in a drug metabolizing enzyme that is needed to clear a particular drug, then something else can happen. So you take the drug indicated by the pink line, the plasma concentration increases, there's very little, de no or very little detoxification and change in the drug and the plasma concentration remains high. You take another dose and the plasma concentration increases and again very little metabolism. And so as you can see from this uh, graph, if your drug metabolism is compromised, the plasma concentration of the drug will increase over time rather than decreasing between each dose. And this is the potential for adverse effects. You often hear about people having adverse drug effects. One of the reasons for this is sometimes too much drug and then they have an overdose of that drug. Now adverse drug effects are, are a real problem um, to civilize, sorry I shouldn't say civilized, but people, developed societies because we take a lot of drugs. And adverse effects are the fourth to sixth highest cause of death 
in developed countries such as the UK and the US. And that's an astonishing number. Greater than 2 million people per year are hospitalized in the US because of adverse drug effects and more than 100,000 deaths result from people not being able to detoxify their drugs correctly. And in the UK, it's estimated that about 10,000 people a year die from adverse drug effects and that the cost to the National Health Service in the United Kingdom is greater than £450 million per annum. Now to put this really into context, in both the UK and the US, more people die per year from adverse drug reactions than they die in car accidents. So that's quite an astonishing statistic and it does show uh, the problem. So we have this field of genetics that we call pharmacogenetics. It's an increasing field as we learn more and more about uh, gene sequences and more and more about what proteins do. And really what pharmacogenetics is, it's the study of how our genes influence the way we handle a drug. So some of you might have heard the term personalized medicine. So pharmacogenetics is really that. Personalized medicine is if we understand a person's genetics, can we tailor their drug treatment to get them the best response to their particular drugs? So I said FMO3 is a drug metabolizing enzyme. And this is a very short list of some of the drug substrates that some of you might have heard of. Um, it's by no means a uh, complete. I've just put a few names here. So uh, anesthetics like buvacaine and lidocaine, benzidamine, which is an anti-inflammatory. Anti uh, it's found in throat lozenges and sprays. And there are a variety of antipsychotic drugs, uh, chlorpromazine, clozapine, flufenazine, olanzapine, perazine, and actually nicotine is also a substrate, as we know, a neuronal stimulant part of cigarettes, um, chemicals, all substrates for FMO3. Now, there have been very few studies to really define the effect of having an FMO3 mutation that lowers activity on a person's ability to handle a particular drug. One study that is proven uh, is the um, inability or the compromised ability of people with TMAU to metabolize benzidamine. Now I've talked about trimethylamine urea and I showed you a very similar slide earlier where I kind of listed the mutations uh, that cause trimethylamine urea. But actually the FMO3 gene is very polymorphic. It has a number of changes from individual to individual. And we talk about things called single nucleotide polymorphisms. These are called SNPs. And that simply means a single base change in the FMO3 gene or in any gene, just a single nucleotide change. But we talk about polymorphisms when they are not rare. So the mutations that cause trimethylamine, urea, are rare. But the polymorphisms affect the general population. And these again are listed here. And if you just focus on the two that are in blue, um, those are two that I will uh, mention. But first let me just mention E158K. So that's at position 158 in the amino acid chain of FMO3. So 60% of the population, that's a world population, have an E at amino acid 158, E is for glutamate, and about 40% have a K at amino acid 158, and K stands for lysine. And then we have these other variations as well. For the E308G, about 80% of people have the 308E and 20% the G at that position. So what might be the consequences for these 
general changes for people? Well, for the E158K, there's quite a bit of literature. Most of it indicates that there's very little difference if you have an E or a K at this position, but actually some drugs have been shown to be affected. For the E308G, if you have an E or a G there at 308, very little effect. However, of course with genetics, it's not straightforward and sometimes you can have a 158K and a 308G in the same FMO3 protein. And when that happens, we have a reduced activity. So if you just have the 158K or you just have the 308G alone, very little influence, but when those two changes occur together on the same protein, then we do find a reduced activity. Now, I don't want you to think that it's all doom and gloom if you have a mutation in the FMO3 gene that influences drug metabolism, because drug metabolism is complicated and complex. And in fact, sometimes it's advantageous to have a mutation. So if we look at the 158K that I've mentioned, or people who have the 158K and the 308G on the same protein, it's actually been found that it's beneficial to have this genotype if you have a familial condition, I won't give you the whole long medical name, but basically they have a familial condition that co causes colon polyps, and one of the treatments for this is Solendac, which is an anti-inflammatory. Now, Solendac is what we call a prodrug. It actually has no drug activity as the mother chemical, Solendac, that you swallow. But the bacteria in your gut convert Solendac to Solendac sulfide. And that's actually the active drug. So the drug is converted in the body to the active drug by gut bacteria. So where does FMO3 come in? Well, FMO3 will add an oxygen onto Solendac sulfide to form the chemical called Solendac sulfoxide. And this is the inactive form of the drug, the one of the chemicals that will clear the drug. So why is it advantageous in this case, or thought to be advantageous, to have an FMO protein that doesn't work as well? As a, as a, a normal FMO3 protein? Well, it's thought that if your FMO3 protein doesn't work so well, then the Solendac sulfide won't be converted as rapidly to Solendac sulfoxide. And that actually then you'll have more Solendac sulfide circulating, and this gives a better chance for the treatment of the colon polyps. And this has been very effective for people with this genotype, and the colon polyps have regressed. So it's an interesting difference where you have a change in your protein that lowers the activity and actually it can be advantageous in the case of Solendac. Now, I said drug metabolism is complicated and complex because many drugs are metabolized by more than one enzyme. And we talk about multi-pathway detoxification. So here we have this little uh, pink triangle, the drug entering the cell. And I've already shown you what can happen with FMO3. It will put an oxygen onto the drug and that drug will form an oxide which will then be excreted. But we have this really huge number of proteins called cytochromes P450. We call them SIPs or P450s for short. What they do is they're also a drug metabolizing uh, enzyme and they add a chemical group called a hydroxyl group, an oxygen and a hydrogen. And that, by adding that OH, they have a similar effect to FMO3. They're converting this drug to a chemical that can then be processed by the body and ultimately it gets excreted through the urine, the bile or the feces. So the cytochrome P450 monooxygenases, or SIPs, 
as I said, we've had we have a lot of different subgenes. This slide looks a little complicated, but let me explain it. So, because we have so many subgenes, scientists have come up with a way of naming these subgenes and the proteins that are coded by these genes so that we know which sub we're talking about. And they divide it into families. So the SIP1 family, for example, has a number of members that are called SIP1A1, SIP1A2, SIP1B1, and there's some more. The SIP2 family is a huge family, just two examples here, SIP2C19 and SIP2D6. And the SIP3 family, and I'm just giving one member here, the SIP3A4 uh, protein or gene. Now, many prescription drugs are metabolized by CYP2C19, CYP2D6, and or CYP3A4. And in fact, estimates are like between 50 and 80% of therapeutic drugs are metabolized by these enzymes. And if you do have a packet of tablets at home, or one of your relatives does, if you take out that little pamphlet and read it, you might see um, in the text that this drug is metabolized by CYP2C19 or this drug is metabolized by CYP2D6. So the pharmaceutical companies are becoming aware of uh, the importance of people understanding uh, which particular proteins metabolize a particular drug that they are prescribed. Now, drugs are often metabolized by more than one CYP and or FMO3. Now, each of these enzymes might produce a different drug metabolite, or several enzymes might produce the same metabolite. So I'm just going to give you an example here of tamoxifen. It's an anti-estrogen drug which is used in the treatment of breast cancer. It's metabolized by quite a, a number of SIPs and also FMO3. CYP2D6 produces a hydroxylated product, that is, it puts an OH group onto the tamoxifen. And this is probably the most active form of the drug. In other words, the drug that has that anti-estrogenic effect, the anti-breast cancer effect, and interacts with the estrogen receptor. Now, CYP3A4 can be a little bit problematic um, in tamoxifen treatment, because it can produce some products that are actually harmful, and these bind to DNA and protein. So that's a bit of a complexity for this treatment. And then we have FMO3, which produces the N oxide. So it adds an oxygen onto the nitrogen of tamoxifen, and this is a detoxification product. Now, interestingly, it's been found that the form of FMO3 that has a lysine at position 158, so we call that 158K, is more effective at producing the N oxide than is the FMO3 that has an E at 158. Now I stress that this has been found in the laboratory and I'm not aware of any clinical trials or large studies that have looked at individuals to show whether there is a significance um, in the whole organism of this difference, 158K and 158E. Now I've talked about multi-pathway drug metabolism, where a drug can be metabolized by FMO3, by one SIP or another SIP, or all of them together. So if we think about the top panel on this slide, and we have a drug, and normally, um, if none of the proteins are compromised, then drug will move into pathway A. If I say about 80% of it will move into pathway A and about 20% into pathway B. However, if there is some mutation in a particular protein that um, compromises the activity of the protein in pathway A, then less of the drug will be able to move down pathway A and then the drug will be shunted into pathway B. So here I've just shown a hypothetical situation of an impairment which causes now only 10% of the drug to go through pathway A and 90% is pushed into pathway B. 
So what I think people need to be aware of is if they have a mutation um, that could influence a drug metabolite, you know, they should be aware of it, but also to understand that in the body, lots of proteins can help to clear one particular drug. Now, sometimes it's really crucial if there's a mutation in one particular enzyme. Um, that can cause a se serious adverse effect. But sometimes it's kind of a mix of, of different things. And we really don't understand the complexities of how um, the whole genetic makeup of an individual influences their particular ability to uh, metabolize a particular drug. And one pathway may always predominate um, over another. Now, I'd just like to end by just mentioning some non-drug FMO3 substrates, because FMO3 has many, many substrates. And there's some here that have rather unpleasant names. Um, we have environmental sulfides, so 4-chlorophenolmethyl sulfide, diphenyl sulfide. FMO3 has a number of pesticides uh, that are substrates for this enzyme. So aldercarb 48 phenthione you might have heard of some of those. Then we have this thing called phenylselenomethyl trimethyl silane, which is a fuel additive. So you can see from those particular, that's, there's a lot of chemicals in the environment that are substrates for FMO3. Then we have uh, farnesyl cysteine, which is a modified amino acid. So cysteine can be modified in the body by adding on this farnesyl group, another chemical group, to call, form farnesyl cysteine. And then we have also selenoalmethionine, which is a methionine analog. Now we don't really, although we know that these uh, chemicals are substrates for FMO3, the consequences for people with TMAU um, of not or having a compromised activity for these chemicals is not known. And then, of course, we have this numerous metabolites which we haven't even begun to understand because we have all of these bacteria in our gut. The gut microbiome is our second genome. We have many, many more bacterial cells in our gut than are in our bodies. So we, we really have this kind of second genome that inhabits our, our, our gut. And as you've seen, it can cause a problem with trimethylaminuria but it's beneficial if you're taking Solendac and you have to convert that drug to the active drug to have a beneficial effect. So, so many bacteria, so many metabolites, and it's going to take us some time to really start to understand how other metabolites might influence uh, the general population, and for you in particular, people uh, who suffer from trimethylaminuria, or perhaps other uh, body disorders. Well, I'd just like to thank you for inviting me to share in your meeting. I hope you found uh, some of this information uh, helpful and informative. And Maria can always uh, let you have my address, uh, email address, if you have any further questions. Can't promise I'll know the answer, but I can try and help. So enjoy the rest of your meeting.